Religionswissenschaft für mich in Englisch ist Translation Studies. It corresponds to Traductologie, Traductologie in Romance Languages. The term Translation Studies dates from 1972, when it was first mapped out in prose by Hull. The Americans do prefer the, the formula Translation and Interpreting Studies to make sure the two things are there. Uh, in Europe, uh, the European Society for Translation Studies uh, believes that translation in English does mean both things, as well as audiovisual, as well as localization, adaptation, and everything else. Okay? A very broad concept. Uh, Russian has stayed strangely with translation theory. Uh, I don't know why, but there you are. When they say translation theory, they really mean the general kind of study or research done with translation. And as far as I can tell, in uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, etc., um, people have translated quite literally translation studies into those languages. Okay. Translation studies in English uh, were put on a par with things like religious studies, women's studies, cultural studies, and others, which simply means that, okay, for example, I'm going to look at issues concerning women and the status of women in society, and I'm going to use any method I can to answer the questions that concern me. So I might do some sociology, some psychology, some economics, some history, anything, okay? And I'm going to use lots of research methods, and the only thing that brings them together is they concern women in society. The same for religious studies, the same for culture. It doesn't have a lot of methods that belong to it itself. The few that do exist just concern the comparison of languages and the ways of mapping operations. For the rest, we draw on other disciplines, and that's what I mean by an interdiscipline. We don't have a lot of, uh, we don't have our own data gathering methods, we don't have our, we have very few data analysis methods. Translation studies, Translationswissenschaft, therefore includes not just Übersetzen, Dolmetschen, Lokalisierung, Uh, authoring all kinds of, of, of secondary uh, text work, uh, revision especially, uh, I think terminology, film lab adaptation, and so weiter. Where did translation studies come from? Uh, one of the origins, in the textbooks you'll often find, oh, James S. Holmes, 1972, <coughs> the name and nature of translation studies. And it's true, that is an article that maps out what can be done in this discipline. I want to propose an alternative kind of origin, and it means going back into Russian, which is why I'm happy the Russian people are here. Okay. Uh, Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky was a translator of children's literature and a literary critic and a literary theorist. And here we have an account of him having an argument <laughs> with a translator, Gumilyov. 1918, all right, 1918, the, the revolution happened in 19... So fresh from the revolution, everything can be begun again, let's build the perfect society. I mean, there were some really... No, no it wasn't sweet, but there were... You know, through to the 22 or so, the 20s were pretty good. Lots of stuff could be done. But here's this argument. Uh, Gumilio comes up with the idea that he's going to write some rules for translators. And Tchaikovsky, as a literary translator, says, well, you can't have any rules for translators because there are no rules in literature. And look... When one translator just ad-libs, improvisiert, and the result is first class, splendid, and another translator works hard, works on the rhythm and the rhyme and the form and does all the research, and the result, what is it? Gelingt ihm not gar nicht. It's not a success at all. Yeah? He says, well, what's the difference? It can't be a rule. 
Because if there were a rule, both these translators would be equally successful. They are not, therefore there are no rules, and it's literature, creation, get the hell out of my discipline. Yeah? In 1918, they could have a spirited argument about this, and the man who wants the rules uh, doesn't agree at all. He loses control of himself and starts to scream. And then the final comment is, uh, but he's a nice fellow and I like him a lot. <laughs> In 1918, they could have an argument and agree to have a good argument. And I think Russians do enjoy arguing. So do Australians, by the way. So I'm, I'm quite happy with this argument type thing. Think about this idea. What would rules for translators look like? And if there were such rules, who could impose them? Uh, there's this thing about professions uh, that the more technical the profession, the more complicated it is, the freer you are, because other people don't understand what you're doing. Okay? Uh, you can see this in, in computer programming or satellite television or what. I mean, they'll make the rules, but help, they don't understand, so you're on your own in, within the profession. Okay? And you can get away with what? Bank, bankers. I mean, they, they write rules for bankers every 10 years. <laughs> they, they invent new products. And, yeah. Who could impose the rules if they existed? on all the translators. Bear in mind, not just professional translators, but everybody trans everybody who knows foreign language, or everybody brought up with two languages, and that's most people in the world, translates at some stage or other. It's, it's a widespread social activity. Who could impose rules? Any guesses? Yes, you saw my next slide. Somebody could. Okay, now I'm just trying to imagine if we had people who could impose rules for translators, what would the rules look like? Now, Adolf Hitler didn't talk about... He's not a great translation theorist, I admit. He's, he's not in the textbooks. But he did have an idea about what should be done with languages and relation to foreign terms. And at a moment when nationalists in Germany wanted pure German, wanted to eradicate foreign terms and go back and get real good. You know, instead of saying oxygen, you say Sauerstoff. Where'd you get that from? Funk technology, well. Okay, when they wanted all that stuff, Hitler came in and said, uh, here in a Tischrede, but also in a Führer, alas, a decree, um, that no, German should import words from abroad. It should be open. And his thinking was, it has to be a Weltsprache, it has to be a language that can conquer the world, and therefore has to take the best from all other languages. Very lucid, very clever. And it could be a rule for translators, if he'd had the mind to impose it. He didn't. That's because of the technicity that I was just talking about. Now, Hitler's not alone. I'm going through the great dictators of the 20th century. Not a big fan, but hey, there they are. Mao Zedong, 1956, is actually giving a talk to the Chinese Musicians Union. He's talking about music. And he says much the same thing. He says, you know, you don't have to go playing Chinese music all your life. You can get some Western music as well. Why not? Which is quite lucid, uh, especially 1956, if you think about it. And he does talk about translations. He says... Personally, I prefer accurate translations, especially theoretical text, by which he means Marxist Leninism. And he says, let's be clear about this basic principle. We have to learn from the West. If you go to a hospital for the surgeon, and you know if in doubt, cut it out, you want him to have the best scalpel available don't you? Not just the one that the Chinese use, or the one that's in the West, but the one that does the job the best. Okay. And uh, Mao's rule would therefore be, be prepared to import from abroad. There could be a rule for translators. I don't want to leave this guy out either. In 1950, uh, Stalin uh, actually published an article, signed an article in Pravda about the nature of language, 
It was an intervention into linguistics, and it was entering a debate where some people said that uh, linguistics should study um, language as the worldview of a social class. There should be a proletariat language, and we should seek the origins of that language in the history of Russia. And Stalin came in and said, no, language belongs to all social classes and to the entire history of the people. And we have to accept it in all its diversity. I think he was actually a pretty good linguist on that, on that score. And the effect of that article was to reorient the study of language or linguistics um, in the Soviet Union bring back people who had been banished who were studying stylistics, uh, for example, and uh, bring back attention to literary translation uh, from a non-nationalistic perspective, because it was once again an opening up of the range of the language. And, and following that, in the years following that, we have great work, notably by Fedorov, um, who proposed a, a general theory of translation, um, and also at the same time by people who were working on literary translation. So it's not just poems, it's also these other things that were happening with respect to translation. Now, what occurred in uh, Russia, in the Soviet Union, was quite interesting. Now, it wasn't that easy Go through 1956, you reach 1958, we have a council of congresses in the Soviet Union where you get two camps screaming at each other, and it's not nice. You get the literary people who want translations that adapt text to create true culture for the true Soviet Union, and you get these linguists who are writing rules of the kind I just mentioned, and they are shouting at each other and they are accusing each other of a literary deviation or a linguistic deviation. And the term deviation politically is very dangerous in that context. And in 1958, there is a feeling at one of the conferences there, and they say, hey, wait a minute. Instead of fighting literature against linguistics, why don't we use both methods to study translation? They say, hmm. That's a strange idea. We might be able to do that. And uh, I get this from Edmond Carré. He was a Russian living in, in Paris or Geneva at the time. And uh, he said, yes, we could do that. They formulated there from a debate about how to study translation, a very serious debate, a compromise solution, which then strangely never got out of Russia. For various reasons, I, I'm writing, I've just finished writing a book on this, for the lack of translation within translation studies, people did really great things in Russian, and nobody in German picked it up, and none of the other languages, well, Bulgarian and Hungarian did. Yeah? But it never got to the West-West European languages. Therefore, in 1972, James Holmes pretends to invent translation studies in entire ignorance of the debate that preceded him. But if you look at it in history, and if you see translation studies as a way of using different methods to study the one object, I think that's where we come from. A very acrimonious debate between lit literary studies and linguistics. Holmes drew a map of translation studies. Have you seen this? Anyone? Actually, he didn't. Gideon Turi drew it on the basis of Holmes' uh, paper. Okay, so Gideon Turi is the guilty person here. He won't mind me saying so. If you studied it, you'll notice, you probably know what I'm talking about there. It looks like any scientific discipline with pure and applied. Pure has theoretical descriptive and applied. Well, we can train translators, we can do translation criticism, and we can develop technology for translation. That's great. Those are things we can do. What's missing in that map? The missing is, uh, Holmes was coming very much from a literary side of business, and his business is looking at texts. So it's as if you're looking at texts. But 
translators are people, and translators have processes going on in the head, and translators have a social status, and you like to get paid, for example. You like to have a career. You like to get trained. Uh, and all that, I mean, the training is there, I must admit. Uh, but the human side of it is remarkably absent, as indeed is the historical aspect. There is no translation history there, which is a, a very strange uh, liquid. My own map of translation studies is much simpler. Three P's, eh? just can't get better than that. Three P's in a pot. Uh, products, people, and processes, and they are interrelated. Don't know why the arrows go that way. They could go the other way as well. There's no reason for them going like this. And then, next to that, those things that you can look at, products are just the text or the, the interpreter's rendition. Okay? Processes are what goes on in the brain, basically, and the use of technology. You can use any methodology you like. Text linguistics, comparative linguistics, contrastive linguistics, corpus analysis, social linguistics, sociology. As for actual data gathering methods, you can use questionnaire surveys, interviews, think aloud protocols. That's when the translator is working and they have to say aloud what they're doing. Okay, it's a way of getting an idea of what's going through their brain. Screen recording, I'll do this with you later on, I think. You just look at the, what they're doing on the computer screen. Eye tracking, I'm doing a lot of this research at the moment. And, and more. Anything that's available to you can be used to answer questions. But I think we should have a wider view of translation studies that encompasses at least those three things. Good. In that loose sense of translation studies, what do we do with the notion of rule, which is not an authoritarian law type thing? You can describe it first, and this is the first thing I'm doing here, is describing the way people have translated the text you just translated. I use the same text, I've been using it for five years, I'm sorry for repeating it, but it enables me to compare you with them, or you compare. This is my class in Monterey. Um, I have about 100 students every year, and I have all those languages, so a few more languages than you here. And here I'm looking at the different ways they translated the term dragon naturally speaking, the brand name. Okay? And it appears twice in the text. So I'm interested in, did they keep it in the source language twice? Okay, SL language twice. Did they keep it just once? Because after all, it's repetitive. Good to get rid of it the second time or explain it or something else. Did they put it into the target language script? This could be Cyrillic or the Chinese, Japanese, Korean scripts. And did they try to explain it? that, hey, it's a dragon, and it speaks naturally. <laughs> it's a very simple problem, and there's no right answer. Is there? No, there's no rule. Nobody has legislated until the company who's paying the money says, you must do it like this. Okay? But there was no company present, so here's what they did. I've now got all these translation cultures. I've got these translators working into different languages. These are the different programs. French is the most homogeneous culture. Everybody did the same thing. Well, there are only five in that group. We don't get many French students. But at least they agree, okay? So if you're working into French and you've got a problem like that, it's a good rule because everybody does it, okay? But if you're going into Korean or Chinese or Japanese, these guys don't know what they're doing. 
It's a heterogeneous translation culture. Some do it this way, some do it that way, but hey, I'm not too sure. Do you know? There's no rule. You're on your own. Figure it out with your client. <laughs> and, and this is real life. I mean, there are relatively homogeneous translation cultures with rel relatively stable rules. You see in the Spanish there's some variation. German a little bit more because Germans didn't like the repetition. Russia, you see, is in between Asia and Europe. It's, it sort of knows what it's doing. But it's got this script thing that they can play with. You, you can use the Cyrillic or not. Okay? And you have to make strange decisions. You know, does my reader know English? Will they understand this little bit of English? Yes. The, the, the point is that in some cases there is a rule, and in others there isn't a rule. And in all cases, it's not a rule as in legislation. In all these cases, what we're really dealing with are, are what Gideon Turi called norms in translation, translation norms, of people who did something here, something here, but most people do this. And you get that, and they fundamentally agree there's some variation, it's always possible, but the norm, the thing that most people do, is this. We're more or less with the French people over here. Okay? And here we can talk about not a rule, but a norm, a fairly well-established norm in that culture, not well-established in this culture, more problematic in this culture than it is in that culture. Norms effectively solve that dispute between the linguistic and the literary. Norms always allow for deviation, for creativity, for norm-breaking. In fact, Gideon Turi, who introduced the concept into translation studies from sociology, fairly straight behaviorist sociology, not really interesting in itself, he immediately wrote a paper saying, training translators to break norms. You know, here's the norm, go and break the norm. Do something different, do something new. He was not proclaiming prescriptively, you shall do what everybody else does. He was saying, find out what people know, do, and then think about whether or not you want to do it. Okay? Norms also change very clearly over history, uh, with history. Verse forms into French. Foreign verse, okay, a poetry written in verse, into French until the late 19th century, always went into prose. Not so into German, not so into English. It was their norm, they had it. It wasn't questioned until people started to feel the need to import uh, forms of blank first, strangely enough. Okay? That's a norm that, that evolved, it changed over time. Okay, so norms are quite a clever way of proposing a kind of rule that works for literary analysis and for linguistic analysis. It will work for both those people who were screaming at each other way back in 1980. Well, I think you've got two senses of norms there. The Rechtschreiben usually comes from a book written by an academy or an educational institution with power. Okay? And they can write rules, like Hitler and Mao and Stalin. But not Amazon, thankfully. Okay? That's one kind of rule. But you can break it, if you want to. Because there's this other rule that says, hey, English terms are cool. Hmm? And, well, um, you, you can break rules, you can break one, break the other, it doesn't matter. But you have to recognize the existence of those norms in order to know the environment you're operating within. If you don't know what the norms are, you're just lost and you're doing anything. And you'll probably get it wrong. If you know what the norms are, you can break the norms, but you'll probably know why.